So how many people have underperforming people in their organization? So raise the hands. All right. What I want you to do is get out your phone and send an email to one of those employees and tell them if you don't perform better by Friday, you're going to fire them. And then you should fire them in front of the whole company so people see the consequences of their inaction inside your organization. <coughs> I'm pretty sure that's actually illegal, but uh, some people probably actually would want to do that sometimes. So what we're talking about today is the dark side of leadership. So start off with kind of the most recent film portrayal of this, of Leonardo DiCaprio in Wolf of Wall Street. And when I was teaching last year, this movie came out, and what might be disconcerting to you is a number of my students actually loved this movie, but not for the right reasons. Um, then, also a nice kind of thing towards gender equality, most of the women were just as terrible as the men. So that makes me feel good that we have the gender equality that women also want to behave poorly in organizations. So um, on a more uh, actual participation, is uh, this is my beautiful city of Cleveland, Ohio, to make you guys feel better about the oil sands. Um, we, d we do bad things as well. What you might see on your tables is a little scenario that's kind of a famous problem in business ethics. So what the scenario is, if you haven't read it, is a vice president comes up to a CEO of the company and says, I have this business plan. It will certainly make us money, but it will probably harm the environment. They enact the plan. It does make the company money, but it harms the environment. How many people, a raise of hands, think that the CEO intentionally harmed the environment? So how many people raise a hands intentionally? So maybe about one third, OK? Then the, another scenario is the vice president comes up to the CEO and says, this pro uh, project will definitely make us money and it will help the environment. So how many people think that the CEO intentionally helped the environment? So raise the hands for intentionally helped the environment. <laughs> so at least you guys are semi-consistent, but you're completely wrong from what the rest of the populace thinks about you. So uh, when, this given, when this is given to non-business uh, executives, 82% of people say that the CEO intentionally harmed the environment. So this is what the average populace, and this has been done now with thousands of people, have felt that CEOs, when they enact some policy, are intentionally harming the environment. Then, of course, when it's helping the environment, only 23% of people actually say that the CEO helped the environment. So the average person, when they think of CEOs, when they're thinking of captains of industry, there is this kind of negative halo over what they think, and why, why could that be? So I'm going to outline just briefly, and then Mac and I are going to have more back and forth, for what I call dark uh, traits of leadership. So one is psychopathy. So this is actually non-clinical uh, psychopaths in organizations. And in the general population, there's about 1% of people who score as non-clinical psychopaths. And these people have poor impulse control, they have low remorse, and they generally will manipulate and harm others to get what they want. Now, what might be disconcerting is the number one job that psychopaths have is CEOs of companies. <laughs> actually, 4% or 5%, 4 to 5% of CEOs are actually non-clinical psychopaths. Um, so out of this room of this many, there's at least probably like two of you. Um, now, another dis, uh, you know, a, a disastrous trait in organizations is overconfidence. And this is particularly my favorite one because I do research on it, so I'm biased. But um, this is particularly relevant in finance and entrepreneurship. So in a survey of 3,000 entrepreneurs, 70% of entrepreneurs thought that they're chance of survival in five years was 80%. More even alarming, 30% thought 
thought that there was a 100% chance that their business will survive in five years, which anybody who is an entrepreneur or invests in entrepreneurship business knows that that is completely stupid. Um, another thing about in finance, uh, another gender uh, positive, is women are better financial investors than men because they are not as overconfident. So they actually do better by about 1%, and that was studied with 50,000 stockbrokers over five years, and I'm not just saying this because I'm not married and there's a bunch of successful women in the room, but this is true, it's just science. Women are better at investing. So if you wanna make a lot of money, hire the ladies. Um, then the next one is Machiavellianism, and this is of course most popularized by House of Cards, and this is when you're lying, manipulating, deceiving people, exploiting people in organizations, and what can happen is sometimes that getting the deal done is more important than having a fair deal, and this is when sometimes we encourage people to engage in these types of behaviors. Then, lastly, is narcissism. So, uh, after uh, Jim DeWald's introduction, uh, it's kind of hard not to think like, oh my God, I'm really good at things because I won awards and stuff. But then I grew up in Cleveland and that is beat out of you as soon as possible. Uh, as my grandmother said when I got my PhD, she said, well, you're not a real doctor. And so, you know, got it down. But uh, people who are high on narcissism have extremely inflated views about themselves. They feel they're more special. They feel they're more deserving of praise. And you can see this in organizations all the time. People like to also blame that the millennials are more narcissistic than anybody else. But I think like a bunch of people going out to the woods in Woodstock to do drugs is also pretty narcissistic. So you old people, you're also narcissists too. Um, and so there is kind of the outline of uh, the four just basic traits just so everybody's on the same path. And now Mac and I are gonna have a couple questions back and forth that we're gonna do and then leave plenty of time for a question and answer. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Justin's uh, dark side specimen today. <laughs> He's the expert. But the, the, first, the first question I wanted to ask relates to um, how prevalent these, these traits are. Uh, our qualities and, and the extent to which we all suffer from them or carry them uh, to some degree. I think it's, it's nice to think that these traits exist in a very, very small part of the, the population, but w what is the experience that we're all having with respect to these, these dark side traits? And how do you differentiate between um, a trait, a personality trait, and and what a psychologist might call a disorder. And so on the disorder side, it's nice to think that there's evil people out there that we can, you know, when they come in to interview, we'll be able to predict that they are these terrible people and we'll select them out of our organization. And that is true to some extent. So there are measures and you can interview people to pick up on these traits uh, if you have a expert which would be me, I live in Kensington, it's really expensive, so I can do some internal consulting for you, um, is that you can pick up on these traits, but all, going back all the way to Adam Smith in Moral Sentiments of Man and Wealth of Nations, he did talk about that capitalism is structured in a way to bring out negative and deceitful characteristics in people. So it is a small segment of the population have these traits or a predilection to them, but also organizations themselves can encourage this type of behavior. And this is probably the most prominent with the 2008 financial collapse. It's nice to think that there was just a bunch of bad people, but actually what was probably more likely is that things were structured in a way for bad things to partially happen. And so there is definitely a prevalence of disorders, but it's also some of the things that as a society or in our own organizations, we are actually encouraging from people. So the system encourages it in a way. Yes. The competitiveness and the drive for, for success. Well, and also you're rewarded for actually engaging in these behaviors. So what is maybe disconcerting is 
These behaviors are negative, especially at the CEO level, because they can have strong negative consequences, but you're actually more likely to be promoted if you have these characteristics, mm. because you're engaging in this competitive, cutthroat business style, which then is picked up as a sign of you can successfully lead, but then down the line, it might have some kind of negative consequences that were unanticipated. Well, the, I guess the question is, um, to what extent have we witnessed these behaviors? And, uh, and how do you deal with them? And for, for those of us involved in, in management and business leadership, uh, how do we deal with them? And I, I would expect that all of us, pretty much all of us would agree that, they, that these characteristics are widely prevalent. And with respect to, and certainly I've seen a lot of it, <clears throat> And I have to say, uh, I've seen a lot of it, not just in, in a mild form, I've seen some fairly uh, extreme uh, examples of these kinds of dark side characteristics. But with respect to how to deal with them, when I look specific, specifically within our organizations internally, uh, and there's some people from, from uh, ARC Resources and ARC Financial who are here today, but the, the one, and when I, th when I th think back, uh, kind of reverse engineer uh, how, how it is we've dealt with these kinds of qualities. And I have to say that it wasn't though that when we started our businesses, we thought, well, we, we want to create a kind of, some kind of structure and processes to deal with these issues. It, it really just uh, arose because we wanted to be successful. And we thought a lot of these issues and these, these behavioral characteristics would work against our success. But we've, we, in both these organizations, we've worked very hard to create uh, a strong culture. And the culture, we would describe the cultures in, in a lot of different ways, but if you look underneath it all, and if you go back originally to the inception of both of these businesses, we had very strong values and we, we articulated uh, these values. And these values then r became norms, or, re or the related behaviors became norms or, or expectations in our organization. And one value was, was, was respect, and, res and respect, the way we described it was respect for each person uh, in uh, every position within the organization. And so wherever you are in, in the organization, and when we started, we, we expressed that view. We also have expressed a view where, where we wanted to create a culture where we were caring of each other. Beyond our workplace roles, there was a, 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 a warmth and a caring uh, uh, for, for, for each other. And that's not something that can be mandated, but it can be modeled if it's authentic. And then similarly, fairness. And lastly, to recognize the personalness, the individuality of people, and to place a value on the individuality and really try to understand the unique strengths of, of people. And, and that, uh, the combination of those values, and we've looked at them in so many, uh, so many different ways, and, at, uh, at ARC Resources, we talk a lot about uh, inter, uh, interpersonal trust and psychological safety for people so that you, you can have as much comfort as you possibly can in terms of expressing yourself and bringing new ideas forward. And people may not ag agree with you, but you can be assured that people are not going to try to diminish you as, as a, a person. And so, in those kind of cultures, the dark side, these dark side tendencies will surface uh, occasionally, uh, but they won't take hold. And then that gets to the next point. The other side of it is a, we sometimes have expressed it as a zero tolerance for anything that looks like abuse. And uh, that might be expressed a little strong, but it sure gets the message across. And the, the reality is, in these organizations, if we see these kind of behaviors manifest in a significant way, we will ask those people uh, to leave our organizations in order to protect our culture. And the interesting thing is that it's not just the leaders asking these people uh, to leave the organization. Often it's the people who work for those people, if you have a real strong culture, because they also want to protect uh, their culture. And there's a couple of other practical things we do is we monitor the, the strength of culture in these organizations. And at ARC Resources, which is a much larger organ, uh, organization, about 600 people, 
we do a, a strength of culture survey that's anonymous, electronic and anonymous, and it's aggregated by, uh, by department. And it is rolled up and presented to the board of directors. And so everybody knows how important it is to monitor our culture. And I don't know of too many companies where, where the directors get involved in, in looking at the, the strength of, of culture. Uh, in that way through and, and deeply into the organization. We've been doing that now for, oh, about 15 years. And we also do 360 reviews uh, throughout the organization, uh, periodically. Uh, and that allows all of us to get feedback about how others are, are seeing us. Because the truth is, we can't necessarily see ourselves objectively. And I would expect most of us feel that we don't suffer from these uh, extreme behavioral uh, issues. And, but it's very, very helpful to, uh, to get uh, the feedback. So then you at least have an opportunity to be able to redress those, those kinds of issues. So if you didn't know, Mac is actually supposed to be the business person and not the psychologist uh, <laughs> expert. I am often confused, actually, by this. But um, <laughs> what actually Mac has done um, at both Arc Financial and Arc Resources would actually literally uh, close down most organizational psychologies consulting. I mean, everything that Mac is talking about of having top down and then still bottom up of engagement into the culture, participative decision making, feedback. 360, all these things are actually safeguards against not only just these dark traits of leadership, but other negative things inside the organization, sexual harassment, discrimination, any of these behaviors by having this type of engagement from the executive level down to you know, entry level staff is absolutely necessary to run uh, your organization the most efficiently. So um, generally, the thing that I was kind of interested in uh, regarding these traits, particularly with entrepreneurship of, say, like investing in other companies or bringing people into your organization, has Mac, uh, have you had experience kind of with, are these warning signs of investing in a company or deciding not to invest in a company? Because I'm assuming if some entrepreneur came up to you and said, I 100% believe my business will be here in five years. That would probably be a warning sign to you to not invest in that person. Yeah, that's a really good, <laughs> that's a really good example. That so, would be an example of overconfidence, as you said, or what I refer to as hubris. Yeah. yeah. Lack so, of realism. Uh, so with then I kind of these warning signs, um, again, Mac, the permanent academic and business person, uh, has then uh, your model here, which feeds in nicely to what we have been talking about here with the dark side of leadership. So you can pre-order Mac's book now uh, today too. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. And I, I developed this a number of years ago, quite some time ago, when I was thinking about uh, my experience with failed organizations and failed leadership. And what I could see that was uh, universal to uh, a, lot of, a lot of failure. And I was focused specifically on the behavioral side, or in a sense, the character side. And uh, in my, my experience is, is not just as an investor, it was as a merger and acquisition advisor for many years. And it so happened that I specialized in, in uh, advising boards of directors on distressed companies and financial restructurings and reorganizations and a few, a few receiverships as well. So when I listed all these companies I'd worked with and some of the companies that we've invested with, uh, I, I, and I thought about a lot of the leaders, one of the qualities that, that came first to mind is what I would call deception. Now you could say simply dishonesty. Uh, but it's a tendency to present the facts and the circumstances in a way to influence you and to increase the probability on, on their part of getting what they want or for you to see re reality and, and circumstances uh, a, a certain way. And it's, 
it can be very subtle or it can be quite, quite grotesque, particularly if you're talking about dishonesty. But deception is actually a little bit more of a subtle word. And, and sitting on boards of directors, it's a huge issue. Uh, if you feel your executive team is holding back information, doesn't want you to see the whole story, or does not want you to, to see the story uh, uh, clearly. A second point is our, our quality, and, and the deception probably is the Machiavellian uh, piece. And the next is entitlement. And entitlement, I thought, deserves specific attention. The, it, the way I would describe it is uh, I deserve because of who I am or because of my position, uh, and uh, I am uh, better than or I am above. And, and I say above because sometimes it shows up as being above uh, company policies or above guidelines, above social norms. And, uh, uh, and it, it, it's scary because I think it's a, it's a door to go through that some people go through and it and it ends up in corruption. And so when I see that attitude, uh, in, even in small ways, I always want to explore it and, uh, and, and, and just see how, how real it is or what it might be pointing to as, a, again, a red flag. Another is, is, uh, is arrogance. And arrogance I would define as uh, thinking you know, which is fine. You know, we have to know, and it helps to know what you know, uh, but that you know and that you are better than. There is this, again, this superiority thing, and, and I, I, a lot of these qualities would also be reflective of, of, uh, of narcissism. And uh, arrogance is particularly uh, dangerous in leadership because it's actually been proven empirically to be hostile towards learning. and, uh, and and developing a learning environment. And so if you have a manager or leader who already thinks he or she knows, how driven will they be to actually develop new knowledge and to, and to explore with you your ideas and, and develop new understandings? And, be, and a learning, that learning attitude is, is, is linked very clearly also in the research uh, to organizational uh, success. And the fourth quality in my little model, which used to just kind of be in my head, I, I guess the, the death piece was, uh, is, is kind of macabre, but it's, it, we're, we're investors, and we're not very interested in investing capital and seeing our, these businesses fail. And so it's the, this, this is threatening. Uh, behaviors are people who will use their, the force of personality or use the authority that they have formally within an organization, and they'll threaten others. They'll threaten people who, who, they, they, who work for them, or they'll threaten their, their co-workers. Uh, and uh, it, this also is uh, uh, e extremely difficult in terms of uh, encouraging uh, high levels of motivation within an organization. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, the overconfidence point that Justin mentioned is I describe that as hubris, and I define that is, as uh, unsupportable risk-taking. And so you're, you're taking risk, and you, you don't necessarily have the resources or the knowledge, really, to take the risk, or the, there is very little benefit or value to actually take the risk. It might be in an organization, a, uh, an E&P company that is so driven uh, toward, towards activity levels and, and, and drilling, and they're getting ahead of their knowledge, for example, in developing a particular uh, project. And that's, uh, that is uh, one of the most dangerous behavioral symptoms that I've seen. And it also ties in with organizations and business leaders who are very interested in sometimes making very large uh, acquisitions, and they might have created a great business, and they basically uh, are jeopardizing the whole company uh, because of, of that particular <coughs> attitude. Now, the, the interesting question is underneath that, underneath those behavioral traits, what, what, uh, what, what's going on? And I, I wanted to present this because this kind of, again, gets to the 
all of our for all of us our our humanness and it's uh, under under each of these traits i believe are feelings experiences that we don't want to have uh, we don't want to see ourselves in certain ways and so uh, and we're afraid if we are seen in a certain way uh, that we will not get what we want, for example, which is the first point there. And I, I've noted the deeper, the vulnerability of, of loss, of not getting what you want, uh, and not achieving can feel like loss, so therefore you're prepared to be deceptive. And, and entitlement, deserving, thinking that you deserve and, and that you are above, uh, I believe that is a defense to feeling uh, unworthy. And I'm not a psychologist. Uh, but I'm sitting around with people, and, and uh, we have a lot at stake. And if, if I see those kinds of qualities, if somebody feels, in a sense, that they're undeserving, and therefore they react to that, uh, that is, I believe, is the dynamic that underlies uh, entitlement. And <clears throat> arrogance is, uh, and, and this is actually proven as well in, in, in psychological uh, research, is, is very much a defense to feeling that you don't know. And it's very uncomfortable to not know, particularly when you're in a leadership position and you believe that other people are expecting you to know. And so you kind of go through uh, a bit of uh, sometimes um, kind of a reactive um, a reaction to that and present yourself um, as knowing. And you're very interested in defending your positions versus really trying to explore what's real and true. And so I see it as a, as a defense. And similarly, threatening. Like, why, why would people uh, be so threatening of other people in, in, in business organizations? And, and my own experience in working with these people is at a deeper level, they often feel powerless. They kind of just don't know how else to be. And they believe they have to create change. They have to move the organization forward. And so they will start to threaten other people in a regular way and in a patterned way. And, and lastly is the hubris is no matter how successful some of us might be, there, there can still be a deeper sense of feeling irrelevant or insignificant. And so if you do one more transaction, uh, you know, step it up uh, you know, uh, significantly uh, through an acquisition or or really aggressive uh, uh, business operations that, that are unsupportable uh, in terms of risk and knowledge and understanding, then maybe you won't feel that way. And it's, so the, I, I believe that there are these, these deeper qualities and that underlie uh, the dark side behaviors. And I mention these because in my own experience, unless you're prepared to see this stuff in yourself, anybody's interested in developing their leadership capacities, unless you're prepared to see this uh, within yourself and to experience the vulnerability associated with it, I, I don't think you can really develop uh, the sensitivities uh, and, in a sense, your, your own humanness, which everybody wants to see if you're in management and, and leadership. People want to see you as being real and authentic. Uh, they don't want a, uh, something that's false. And, uh, but the only way you can really get there and be authentic, uh, I have found, is to actually experience the, and put yourself in a position where, there, where you might be experiencing uh, your, own, your own vulnerability. Now, we've, we're pretty much wrapped up here, but <clears throat> the experience of vulnerability is, certainly ties in with the way a lot of people view humility. And actually, on that point, I'm going to actually ask Justin if he might want to make a comment about yeah, that. Yeah, so just really quickly, again, Mac is kind of ahead of the curve of doing things in his own organization, is a really new emerging trend in leadership is what's called exploring humility, or the humble, humble leadership. And there's been a number of Harvard Business Review articles, articles in the top uh, journals. I've done some of this research myself. <clears throat> and what the research shows is when you have leadership who engages in participative decision making, listens to 
uh, their subordinates actually second guesses themselves. So Philip Tetlock has studied expert predictors there uh, for over 20 years and found those who second guess themselves and try to d prove themselves wrong are better at decision making and are better leaders. And what this shows is this leads to higher job satisfaction, higher employee engagement, better team effectiveness, and most importantly to organizations, better job performance. So when you have this type of leadership style that's getting everyone engaged, this then leads to the best type of job performance. And this is after controlling a wide variety of things, including individuals' own intelligence level. So it's just that having this reciprocating leadership style really, really leads to some positive influences.